Okay, well, the, uh, the next speaker is, uh, well, what a, what a great guy, Seb, Seb Bunny. He's done a lot of great work with Looking Glass Education with his partner in crime, Daz, and uh, his book as well, his book that he just released a few months ago, uh, The Hidden Cost of Money. And I was very humbled when, when Seb reached out to me to see if I would uh, write the foreword for him for that book. So if you've not got a copy, it is for sale at the book corner. And uh, I highly recommend that you read it because, uh, well, as you'll see after the presentation, once uh, Seb takes us through it, he's thinking about, you know, how does this look, this, this transition, which is what this, uh, this block is all about. So I think we're uh, almost ready to go. Do I get a thumbs up back there to bring on Seb? Yeah? Well, Seb's given me the thumbs up, so as long as he's ready. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Welcome Seb Bunny. Hey everyone, one second, chucking down my water. This may be too much information, but as a introvert desperately trying to look like an extrovert, one of the things I find so nerve-wracking about speaking, probably the most nerve-wracking is, I never quite know how to engage the host. Do I go in for the handshake? Do I go in for the hug? And the amount of times I've gone in for the handshake and then I grab his fist and then you do the gear stick, it's so uncomfortable. So anyway, for this presentation, I really wanted to talk about something slightly different. I wanted to talk about our role as a community, our role as an individual, and what our voice means in Bitcoin. And so, more than anything, I want to talk about your role in the community. And so, hopefully, by the end of this presentation, I want you to start questioning, what is my voice? How can I show up in the world of Bitcoin? And how can I kind of find myself? So, there's a saying in Bitcoin called, we are all Satoshi. And maybe put up your hands for a second if you've heard of this saying or this meme. Sweet. There's a few of you guys. So for me personally, it took me a long time to really grasp what this saying, we are all Satoshi, means. I didn't quite get it. And it wasn't until I was deep down the rabbit hole that I really started to grasp what this saying, we are all Satoshi, means. And for those that are not familiar with the saying, basically, Bitcoin, because it is a decentralized currency and it is digital in nature, there is no marketing department. There are no central planners that are going to push Bitcoin and ensure its success. Ultimately, its success is on our shoulders. Its success is on the shoulders of people like you, the people that have just been on this stage. In the end, it is our voice, it's our ability to express ourselves and share what we know, what we've experienced with our friends, with our family, with the community at which we engage in that is going to ultimately help Bitcoin succeed. And what I think is fascinating is we all have our own experience. We all have our own background. Some of us are doctors, some of us are mountain bike instructors like myself. Some of us may be medics. In the end, because we have our own experiences, we speak to a unique cohort of individuals. And so this is why it is so important to share your voice. We should try and push through that fear of imposter syndrome. I must know everything about Bitcoin before I start talking about it. So I urge you guys by the end of this to start thinking about how can I find and share my voice? So the important thing is why does this really matter? Why does it matter about sharing our voice with Bitcoin, uh, sharing our voice about Bitcoin? Why does it matter that we try to move towards a currency that meets the needs of the populace? Well, the reason why I believe is because money matters profoundly. To me, the way that I look at money is that like language, money is a form of expression. It is how we express to the world what it is that we value. And for an analogy, if you walk into a grocery store, and you see someone buying grass-fed beef and organic vegetables. And then you go and see someone buying microwave meals and candy and processed foods. What that is saying is it's telling you a lot about what they value. Someone really values good quality food, supporting local industry. Another person isn't thinking about that. Ultimately, where we spend our money in the economy is a reflection of us and our values. 
So it is really important for us to have a type of money that allows us to express ourselves authentically. But the problem is, like language, money can be censored. Inflation is a form of censorship. When we're losing our purchasing power because prices are rising, ultimately, that purchasing power isn't just disappearing. The money printers, those that are in charge of creating new currency units, are able to use that money where they see fit. So our purchasing power is being taken from us and being spent elsewhere in the economy. If we don't support war, but we're finding inflation and currency debasement, and our purchasing power is being spent on war, it doesn't matter what we believe in. Our expression is being diluted. So I think this is really important. When we have a broken type, when we have a broken money, it impedes our ability to show up authentically in this world. It impedes our ability to express ourselves monetarily. Now, I think it's really important to talk about the fact that when money breaks down, we see many issues in society. But as we we're just talking about, when it comes to our voice and us as individuals, I'm going to share a little bit about my story and my background and how I view money in the hopes that it will inspire you to walk away and think about how money has impacted you and think about how maybe you can share your voice to support others along their own journey. So my background, these are a few events, and I'll share three events that have really shaped my beliefs in money. Many of these didn't come about during the moment. Many of these beliefs came about in hindsight when I looked back on my own personal experiences. The first one is I was raised under a single mum. My parents separated when I was very young. Because of that, my mum had to support my two brothers and myself and put a roof over our heads and food on the table. And so ultimately, as our money lost purchasing power, it meant that my mum had to work more and more and more which also meant that she maybe wasn't able to meet the emotional needs of my two brothers and I to the extent that maybe she had wished she could have. So already, when I looked back on this, I started to realize money is shaping how we're showing up in the world. Money is shaping our parents' ability to meet our emotional needs as children. Hmm, it's interesting. We've got rising rates of anxiety, depression, all of these things that are coping strategies, but more on that in a second. And then secondly... When I was about nine years old, I remember walking into a toy store, and this toy store had a scooter, and this scooter I was totally enamored by. I wanted this scooter so badly. And so I started saving. I saved for about two or three months for this scooter. I saved all my pocket money. It was blood, sweat, tears, everything, just to get this scooter. And then we walked in to go purchase this scooter with my dad and my two brothers, and my dad ended up saying, oh, I feel bad that you're getting this scooter and your two brothers aren't. So you know what? You can pay for your scooter, and I'll pay for your two brothers. And this destroyed me as an individual. I felt I'd put so much time and energy into working hard to try and get something that I've been motivated to buy, something that could make my life better and improve my life at that time, only to see someone get given it for free. Now, in finance, there's something called the Cantillon effect. In simple terms, that is, those closest to the monetary spigot benefit disproportionately. What is interesting is this is how our monetary system works. Those closest to the monetary printer benefit disproportionately. This experience, this Cantillon effect, was on a microcosm level in my family. I was trying to work hard, but those that were leaning in, those that were closer to the monetary spigot, my father, were benefiting disproportionately. So it started getting me questioning about the world around us. Why did it feel so unfair? And looking back again, it made me realize something about our money is happening here. And the final story that I'm going to share is one of my passions since such a young age has been mountain biking. I started when I was about kind of eight, nine years old, and then into my teens, I started watching all of the mountain bike movies and seeing my idols on the big screen. And then I decided this is something that I want to do as a career. I want to become a mountain bike instructor. So I moved out to Canada. I started taking all of my mountain biking qualifications, and Soon enough, I started working with these idols, these individuals that I'd seen on the world stage, these individuals that were world-renowned. But what I came to realize very quickly was most of them were up to their neck in debt. They were struggling financially. Most of them were still renting. They couldn't afford a property. But these were people that are in all the big movies. It made me realize that if I wanted to try and get ahead in life, I had to create passive income. I had to go and invest. I had to go and do these things that were maybe not necessarily in alignment with what it is that I wanted to do. 
So again, this made me start to realize our monetary environment, there's something about our money which is impacting our ability to show up how we want to show up. There's something about our money which is making it harder and harder and harder to get by. So from this, I kind of came to the realization that everything is downstream of money. When our money is broken, when our money doesn't meet the needs of the people, it impacts us and how we show up. It impacts our ability to listen to our authentic selves. My mum wasn't able to meet the emotional needs of my two brothers and I to the extent she would have liked to because of our money. I wasn't able to pursue the career path that I really, really wanted to because of our money. So I think it's really important to start thinking about how has money impacted you as an individual? How has money maybe impeded or impacted your relationships or how you want to show up in this world? So let's dive into money a little bit. When it comes to money, it can be hard to kind of grasp money's influence on us. So we're going to dive into kind of the link between money and behavior, because once we grasp behavior, then we can start to look at specific examples. So first off, as Bitcoiners, we may be familiar with this idea of time preference. But for those who are not, I'll give you a little breakdown. Time preference is basically, do I look to the future and think about security and prosperity and long-term thinking, or Am I trying to focus on meeting my immediate needs? I'm trying to meet this kind of these impulses that are arising right now. And the reality is that the money we use today, because it is losing value over time, we're no longer incentivized to save. Instead, we're incentivized to consume. We're incentivized to get what we can and meet our immediate needs because our money is worth less one day to the next. So this is really important to think about. Money is shaping how we're showing up. If our money is losing value over time, we're not incentivized to think about the future. We're only incentivized to think about, okay, what can I do right now to meet my immediate needs? And the next thing is meaninglessness and apathy. When it comes to money today, the challenge we face is that because money is losing value, people are trying to flee the currency into assets. Asset prices are rising. The cost of living is rising. Food, shelter, everything is rising which makes it very hard to predict the future. It makes it very hard to plan for the future and try to put time and energy into things that will help improve our life. Not only that, but we can see, I think it's something like off the top of my head, millennials at the average age of 30, which we are a few years ago, only own 4% of the housing market. The baby boomers, when they were at an average age of 30, they owned 35% of the housing market. So what you're starting to realize is it is very hard for certain generations to get ahead, and it's increasingly getting harder. So we're starting to see meaninglessness, nihilism, nihilism apathy starting to set in. Because people, they don't know how they're going to get ahead. They don't know how they're going to make money. They don't know how they're going to put food on the table. Now, what is also interesting is there is something called your locus of control. In psychology, what this means is, do I believe the external world has control over my future? Or do I believe that I have control over my future and the world around me? Now, people with this external locus of control that believe that the world basically governs them have much worse health outcomes, much higher rates of depression, much higher rates of anxiety, whereas people with an internal locus of control that believe that they can govern their future, they can control their trajectory, tend to have much greater health outcomes, much greater happiness levels, much lower rates of depression, and much greater health outcomes. Now, what is interesting is, again, when it comes to money, money is impacting our locus of control. If we can't plan for the future, meaninglessness can quickly set in. And lastly, I'm going to touch on just altruism and compassion. Fear, when it arises, it narrows our aperture of awareness. When we are scared, when we are threatened, it impacts our ability to kind of look outwards, to help others, to support others, to do the things that which really resonate with us. Instead. We're simply trying to protect ourselves. So when it comes to money, when money is breaking down, when it is becoming harder and harder to get by, all of a sudden, we start looking out for ourselves more, rather than looking to the community, looking out to family. Now, in psychology, again, there's something called Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which, if you guys are familiar with, is a five-tier pyramid. And at the bottom of that pyramid, it is our basic needs, security, shelter, food, water. And as we start moving up, we go into relationships. And then we start going all the way, uh, all the way to the top, and we have self-actualization. But the reality is that we cannot move up the levels of this pyramid 
unless we meet our basic needs. Those basic needs of food, those basic needs of shelter. So if our properties are getting more expensive, if rent is getting more expensive, if our food is getting more expensive, this means it becomes harder and harder for us to be able to meet those high level needs, to start giving back, having more compassion, having more altruism, giving back to the community. So again, we're starting to see money is impacting how we're showing up in this world. So now that we have kind of an idea of how money impacts our behavior, let's take a look at some specific examples. So we're going to touch on kind of four examples, and we'll dive into each one. And then we'll wrap it up with a little bit of Bitcoin. So the first one is kind of just environmental degradation. And we'll skip over these because we've got specific slides. But we've got environmental degradation. As our money loses value, we're incentivized to consume, which is impacting our environment. We're also going to dive into the parent-child bond. As our money is worth less over time, our parents have less time to commit to their children. So it's impacting children's development. We also have government and politics. When the government has a money printer, it is able to, uh, it's able to fund operations without support from the populace. And then finally, business practices. Where, when a government is intervening, when the government is stimulating the economy, it's misaligning the incentives for businesses. Businesses are taking more risk. Businesses are having to compete artificially. So let's dive into these. So environmental degradation. I briefly mentioned it, but when our money is worth less over time, we're no longer incentivized to save. Instead, because our purchasing power is worth its most in this present moment, we're actually incentivized to consume because our purchasing power goes its furthest right now. What is happening is because of this, we have this very consumerist society. We're being told we just need to stop consuming, but the reality is that's not the incentive. The incentive for our money is to consume. The incentive for our money is to do what we can now because our purchasing power is greatest now. So we are decimating our waterways, we're decimating our forests. We're decimating our minerals in the ground, all because we've got this consumption society that is trying to get what they can while they still can. Now, what is interesting is we have this big so-called climate movement that supposedly cares about the climate. But the reality is that I would say that is nowhere near the truth. If we look at GDP, GDP is gross domestic product. GDP is made up of transactions which are kind of all the transactions within an economy within any given year. Well, 68% of GDP transactions are consumption, which is interesting because the government is targeting 2 to 3% GDP growth every single year. So what they're really saying is we're trying to grow consumption in the economy every single year. So you've got this, on the one hand, the government is coming out and saying we care about the environment, and on the other hand, they're actually trying to promote more and more and more consumption, which is impacting our environment. Now, what is interesting is we can see this in real time. From the 1950s, there were around 2 million tons of plastic produced. Today, that is over 420 million tons of plastic produced. That's hugely outstripping the gross population. So you're starting to realize, as our economy is breaking down because of our monetary environment, we're consuming more and more and more of our natural resources for consumption stuff. And most of this plastic is never being recycled. Not only that, but as our governments intervene, as our central banks intervene and they start suppressing interest rates, trying to stimulate the economy, what ends up happening is we actually encourage debt consumption. If our interest rates are artificially low, then it becomes easier for companies to borrow. And if it's easier for companies to borrow, then we start to see supply chains starting to expand. When supply chains start to expand, we're consuming resources to help move those products around the world. Today, uh, I think the average product touches six countries before it ends up on our doorstep. That is an immense amount of resources consumed just by kind of bouncing around from country to country. So let's kind of dive into the next slide, the parent-child bond. When it comes to parenting, I think more than anything, I would say most parents in the crowd want to support their children and their children's emotional needs. The challenge we face today is that our money is breaking down, our money is deteriorating, our purchasing power is declining over time, which means our parents have to seek out more and more ways of generating income. They have to spend more time at work just to meet their uh, financial needs. The challenge with this is that people today, children today, are not getting their emotional needs met because parents are having to work more. Now, this chart that I have up on the screen is highlighting that in Canada, from 1976, just after the departure of the gold standard, to 2015, we have seen a doubling of dual earner households and a halving of single earner households. Again, this is simply highlighting that today, 
People are struggling to get by. Parents are having to go out, both parents are having to go out and work just to be able to make ends meet. And what is also fascinating is this isn't just impacting parents, it is impacting the kids. When kids are not getting their emotional needs met, this leads to high rates of depression, high rates of anxiety, high rates of obesity, because although sometimes these things can be genetic, the majority of the time, they're coping mechanisms. They're coping mechanisms because those children have not had their emotional needs met. But not only that, it starts to impact us from the moment of inception. When we're inside our mum's stomach, what ends up happening is when our mum feels an immense amount of stress, stress hormones like epinephrine, adrenaline, cortisol, the baby feels that acutely. That impacts the baby's nervous system and their ability to be able to regulate their nervous system. So when we're born, we're born with a hypersensitive nervous system. That's going to impact our health outcomes in the future. It leads to higher rates of allergies, um, immune system disorders, you name it. And this is all because a mum was feeling stress. Now what is also interesting is money is the number one stressor globally. In the US, 76% of people face monetary stress. And I think there was an interesting quote that I came across, which was, in 2020, 84% of working mothers could not afford to take time off, and 57% had no choice but to keep working. So again, this is just highlighting that our monetary system is impacting our relationships. This is also true for government and politics. And this is something that most of us have probably heard about. When it comes to the government, the challenge that we face today is that government has a money printer. That means the government can fund operations without support from the populace. They can fund operations, they can run deficits at the expense of the currency holders. When they print more currency units, that impacts our purchasing power. The challenge with that is, as a private free market organization, we cannot compete. We cannot compete on price, we cannot compete on wages. In Canada, in the US, and I'm guessing most countries globally, the average public sector job actually plays 10% more than the average private sector job. So over time, the public sector, the government jobs, slowly engulf the private sector. This chart is showing the top black line is the growth in public sector jobs from the 1950s onwards. The gray line is the growth in private sector jobs, and the dotted line is the growth in population. So what we're seeing is the public sector is slowly engulfing the private sector. But not only that, we're also seeing that the growth in jobs is far outpacing population growth, which is highlighting that, again, it's getting harder and harder to get by, so people are having to take on more jobs. Now, this also means that as the government is spending beyond its means, as the government is borrowing from the future and taking on debt, ultimately, the economy is becoming more and more fragile. It has to service its debt payments. As it's servicing its debt payments, the challenge we face is that the government is going to increasingly increase regulation and infringe upon our rights and freedoms to be able to meet its obligations. Now what is interesting is today, eight out of 10 people globally live in not free and unfree countries, or not so free countries. And I would also say that the two out of 10 people that live in so-called free and democratically free countries do not live in democratically free countries. I live in the country of Canada, and we have Trudeau as a dictator. And during the pandemic, we experienced... <laughs> so during the pandemic, we experienced the trucker convoy. If you protested, if you voiced your opinion, and it was against that of the government, you potentially had your bank account frozen and you were censored. I wouldn't say that's a free country, but Canada is supposedly one of those two out of 10 countries that is free. So I know I'm conscious, I'm conscious of time, so the last one is business practices. When it comes to business, the challenges we face come from all sides on businesses these days. When the government interjects and starts pumping money into the economy to try and stimulate the economy to support businesses and support people, this leads to a whole host of byproducts. The first byproduct, and one of the major byproducts, is that when the government steps in and starts bailing out fiscally irresponsible companies, companies that should not exist because they have not managed their finances correctly, they're now allowing more companies to rise up that should not exist. What that does is for companies that actually are offering value, they're now having to compete with companies that should not exist. That means that capital that could have gone towards research and development, it could have gone towards innovation, is now being directed towards competition and marketing. So this ends up basically impeding humanity's ability to move forward, humanity's ability to grow and thrive. But on top of that, 
it's also impacting them not only from the competition front, but it's also impacting them from many other fronts. What about the employee front? Well, I'm going to give another Canadian example. During the pandemic, anyone who had lost, I believe it was 10% of their income, were entitled to the CERB, the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit. That was $2,000 a month, or $24,000 a year. Well, if you take a look at the Canadian tax records, 30% of Canadians earn under $25,000 a year. So what you've basically said to them is, do you want to work full time for $25,000 a year, or we'll just give you $24,000 a year and you don't have to work. So of course they took it. All of a sudden, all of these small businesses, they were out of employees, they were struggling. This is because it misaligns the incentives. It breaks down the incentives in society. When the government intervenes, it begets more intervention. So of course the government had to step in more, give more money to corporations, give more money to businesses. So when governments intervene, we really have to start questioning, what are the byproducts of this? How is it impacting us? The last one, well, actually, I'll, I'll skip to the next slide because I'm conscious of time. When it comes to money, it is a really challenging situation that we're in. We're on a trajectory that is slowly breaking down society. It's breaking down our social fabric. It's breaking down our relationships, our politics. It's breaking down our environment. So I think it's important to kind of question, what solutions do we have? Now, I'm sure you guys, given that we're at a Bitcoin conference, understand what I think the solution is. I think that solution is Bitcoin, and I'm sure you guys can probably agree. So I'm going to dive quickly into these, and then we can wrap up from there. But ultimately, Bitcoin is the first time in history that we have had a decentralized digital asset that is scarce. What that means is, for the first time in history, no one entity can debase the currency. No one entity can print currency units at the expense of everyone else. It is trustless. We don't have to rely and trust intermediaries and third parties. It is permissionless. We don't need permission to be able to spend our money. We can spend it where we see fit. Now, what this means is we can fix, and I truly believe, resolve many of the issues that we've just discussed. So let's take a look. When it comes to parenting, if over time, if our money is increasing in purchasing power, what does that do for parents? Well, parents are now, one, they're incentivized to save, but two, it means their, their expenses, their cost of living, houses are slowly going to come down. That gives them more time to spend with their children. That gives them more time to direct their capacity to where they want to go, where they want to kind of, uh, where they kind of, that's a mind block on the words. Anyway, so you're starting to realize that when money breaks down, it impacts us negatively. But if we can invert this, if we can have a money that basically increases in purchasing power over time, it can then help support us, be more of, meet more of our authentic needs, support our children. The same is true for our environment. If our money over time is increasing in purchasing power, it flips the incentives. It incentivizes us to start saving because our money is actually worth more in the future. So if our money is worth more in the future and we're starting to incentivize saving, well then we're gonna reduce consumption. That means that all of these companies that are no longer, all of these companies are basically creating worthless products. They're trying to just make money from plastic products, you name it. A lot of these companies, they're going to see a reduced cash flow. If they cannot survive fiscally, they're going to wither away. The ones that are surviving are going to be the ones that offer value, the ones that offer quality. So I think it's really important when money is able to slowly increase in purchasing power, we're re incentivized to save. And if we're incentivized to save, we're allowing the free market to decide what is valuable. We're no longer supporting broken companies. We're no longer supporting consumption. Not only that, but in government and politics, when we remove the monetary printer from the government, we realign the incentives. The government has to compete like any other business, any other free market entity, which means it will only survive if it is offering value. Because the only way that it can obtain capital is if we voluntarily give capital over to the government because we believe in that government. And I think this is very important. If the government cannot intervene when it wants, it has to be fiscally responsible. It has to think about the future. On the healthcare front, it no longer means just constant uh, intervention. It no longer means constantly impulsively trying to meet the needs of the populace by printing more money. It means how do I make my healthcare budget smaller? How do I ensure that my populace is more healthy? Well, I've got to think about long-term health. I've got to think about nutrition. I've got to think about the psychological effects rather than just pharmaceuticals, which I think is so incredibly important. And then finally, on the business front, if the government cannot intervene and interject, what that ultimately means is we have a free market. 
Businesses that offer value will thrive and they will rise to the top. Businesses that won't will drop away and they'll wither away. We will see less unproductive capital being wasted. We'll, or sorry, we'll see unproductive capital, we'll see less unproductive capital, and we'll see more businesses that are truly offering value being able to direct capital towards creating value, towards innovation, towards advancement, rather than just artificial competition because there are so many businesses out there that are zombie companies, companies that should not exist. One of the key points, which I briefly didn't touch on, was 40% of small companies in the US should not exist. They do not have the revenue to be able to cover their debt obligations. And 20% of all public companies in the US are unable to cover their debt obligations. This is huge. These are companies that are being supported artificially. So to end, we are all Satoshi. Ultimately, the success of Bitcoin falls on our shoulders. This was my story and my experience about how I have interacted with money and how money has shaped me and has shaped those people around me, my relationships, my family. But I urge you guys more than anything to think about how money has impacted you, how money has impacted your relationships and how you want to show up. And I urge you to speak to your community, speak to a unique cohort because each of you has a unique story. And so to end, I just want to thank everyone for coming today. And I want to thank everyone at the Free Madeira organization because Andre and the team have done such a phenomenal job. Oh. It truly is events like this where you're meeting people in person, which is what helps grow Bitcoin. I stood back for quite a while looking at Bitcoin from the sidelines, and it wasn't until I jumped in and started interacting that I started meeting like-minded people like you guys and collaborating and allowing ideas to percolate to the top. So if you guys want to check out more, we have Looking Glass, which is the company I co-founded. We have Looking Glass, a booth over in the back corner, and we do educational sessions, although the day is nearly over. We also have two books at the book corner, Beers for Bitcoin, about the holistic approach to Bitcoin, and then The Hidden Cost of Money, which is my personal book, which discusses a lot of the issues that we've just talked about, and ultimately how money weaves its influence into our own uh, spheres, how it impacts us, how it impacts our ability to show up authentically. And then lastly, I also work for a company called Block Rewards, and Block Rewards, we deal with, we're re reimagining compensation and rewards through the lens of Bitcoin. And so feel free to reach out anytime, and I'm more than happy to chat. Thanks a lot, everyone. Yeah.